Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to The Open Mic, Writers in Their Own Words, the show where every episode I talk to writers, editors, agents, and sometimes others in the publishing game to learn a little bit more about them and the work that they do. I am your host, Rich Eisen, and um, no, not the guy on the NFL Network. I shouldn't have to explain that, but sometimes it feels like I must, so there you go. And if that sounds like I recently ran into somebody who had had a conversation with who thought the whole time he was talking to that other guy, that's why I just said that. Anyway, the show, my show, is available on YouTube and via all of the major podcast platforms, and you can subscribe to either or to both so you never miss a thing. Now, I was going to introduce my guest today as a debut author, but that's not quite true. She has, in fact, ghost or co-written at least 14 books, including five, five New York Times bestsellers. She is the author of the father-daughter memoir, Good Girl, and a longstanding music journalist and critic whose work has appeared in major publications all over the country. I had the pleasure of making her acquaintance at Left Coast Crime this year, and I am really excited to have her here today to talk about her debut novel, the Last Days of the Midnight Ramblers, described as a, uh, and I quote here, a gripping tale about the complicated legacy of a legendary rock band, unquote, my insertion, like, oh, I don't know, the Rolling Stones, <laughs> and the ghostwriter who is telling their story. Sarah Tomlinson, I am really excited to have you here on the show today. Welcome to the Open Mice. Thanks, Rich. I'm so glad to be here. It was lovely to meet you at Left Coast Crime, which is always one of my favorite uh, conferences. And the fact that you're a Rolling Stones fan makes it even more exciting to talk about my book. I think the word I used when we were talking was I'm an obsessive. That may be not quite true, but I know probably as much about the Stones as, as most casual fans do for sure. But I'm going to hold the book up one more time because it's a great cover too. I really, really like this cover. And uh Sarah was uh, gracious enough to sign, even though this was a signed edition, she signed an edition for me. So I'm, I was very excited about all of that. I'll hold the book up again before we leave. So uh, those of you on YouTube, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. For the uh, folks on the podcast, you'll, you'll get it too. So anyway, we're going to cover a lot of ground here today, uh, but I want to get started with the new book. I had a hard time putting it down until I finished it. And, and that really, as much as I read, I often, you know, have to keep many books going at a time, as you might imagine, doing what I do. Uh, but this one got priority over everything, and I read it until I finished it, because I just thought it was fantastic. So I gave a little bit of the of a description in the intro, but uh, for the uninitiated, uh, why don't you tell us all about the book? Okay, great. Well, I do consider that a huge tribute, because I know myself, I often have uh reading I need to do for a panel that I'm going to be on or for research that I'm doing. And so the books that I even am loving can often make their way to the bottom of the pile. So first of all, that is a huge compliment and I'm going to take it gratefully. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I call this book a rock and roll whodunit. And I have to give credit to my longtime agent, Kirby Kim, who is brilliant and has been in the trenches with me of the ghostwriting since back in 2008. And so he said to me a few years ago, Sarah, you should really write a thriller about a ghostwriter. He was like, I think readers and viewers too love to be brought into a world they know nothing about. And because ghostwriting is, you know, by its nature, a closed world, uh, it's meant to be sort of mysterious. It's a perfect setting for a book. And then um, I knew, well, okay, if I'm going to write a ghostwriter, she's got to write a memoir with someone famous. Who is that going to be? And because of my background as a music journalist and just my overall passion for music, I would say probably music memoirs are the um, some of the pleasure reading I do the most of. Uh, I just immediately was like, oh my gosh, it's got to be clients who are involved in the rock and roll world. And so my uh, ghostwriter, Mari Hawthorne, who's based on me when I was a baby ghostwriter back in 2011, gets hired by this woman, Anka Bourbon, who had been the companion. She does not like to be called a groupie because she's not a groupie. She's a companion of and wife of several members of this band, the Midnight Ramblers, who were considered one of the great rock bands of all time. And um, yes, they are loosely based on the Rolling Stones. Although in the world they exist in, the Rolling Stones exist as well. Right, which I, I, I caught that reference early, which I thought was really, really kind of fascinating. 
Well, and I think I, as I said, I, I think I told you I was a Stones obsessive, which is yeah, mostly true. But um, although that's the obvious comparison, the obvious model here, it's not a requirement for a reader to know all of this tortured history between you know, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards and Anita Pallenberg and Brian Jones uh, at all. In fact, it might even be a little better if you don't know all of that, right? I think so. I mean, I will say that part of the inspiration for the book was that um, when I read Keith Richards' book, uh, you know, his memoir, which was iconic and great. I heard a rumor in the music industry that there was something that had been left out of that book. I have no idea if that's true or not. I'm not enough of an insider to even know what it was. So I'm not going to pretend to have more bona fides than I do. But I started thinking about that, like, gosh, what if there was someone who was at that level and there were sort of known secrets in the industry about them? Again, I don't know if this is true or not. And then, of course, the real story of Brian Jones drowning, which was very tragic and did happen in the summer of 1969, as my character Mal um, also drowns in a swimming pool in the summer of 1969, has always been shrouded in mystery. And there has been a rumor that perhaps he was murdered. And there is a book that was written by the woman he was dating at the time that he died that alleges he was in fact murdered. And I own it. And, you know, I never actually read it because I was afraid I would get too much of that story in my head. And although I wanted that to be the starting point, I certainly didn't want to get too tied to the the actual band and the actual members of the band. Right. I mean, that that is one of those things you have to be careful at, when you're writing fiction you know, to not have too much of that outside influence come in so that it, it isn't your story anymore. You're just aping a, a different story that, is, you know, even journalists, we run into that all the time. You got to be really careful, not just to regurgitate all this research that you've done, right? You've got to do something that's original. Um, and of course, the protagonist of the book, as you know, is a ghostwriter, uh, which obviously, you know, that is your world. You know a lot about it. And I really, really loved how you start each chapter of the book with, I don't want to call it a lesson, but with a, with a, a thought uh, on the challenges that a ghostwriter faces and how that person needs to think uh, to deal with those challenges and to get their subject to trust them and to share and to talk with them. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? I mean, how, how was that process for you to learn all these things and 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 then what really makes for a great ghostwriter? Uh, well, it's such a good question. And I do feel like that um, structural device or framing device for the book was a final piece that my editor suggested. We knew that there were going to be these how-to components from the beginning. And originally, the book was called How to Be a Ghost, which was sort of a play on the fact that I've done so many how-to books in my career that you would think I'm perfect at this point. You know, the like how to succeed in business, how to succeed in love, how to, you know, be a badass, like that sort of thing. Um, so at first that was just sort of playful. But then because there was this original idea of what can I teach readers about ghostwriting? What does it really mean to be a ghostwriter? They were just a, a super useful tool for getting at that information and really thinking about it on a deeper level. And I think one of the most common um, questions I get or assumptions I hear from people when they learn that I'm a ghostwriter is something sort of derogatory about celebrities. Like, oh, well, they must be so stupid. Like they can't even write a book or all they do is play golf or fly around in their jets. And for one thing, that has not been my experience at all. Um, my clients have mostly been incredibly lovely and very hardworking. I think you can't succeed at that level by accident, right? Whether you're in entertainment or sports or an entrepreneur, and um, also there are tons of famous people and rich people who don't ever want to write books, right? They might get a residency in Las Vegas or start a perfume line or something. So the people who do want to write books, even with the help of a ghostwriter, usually have something that they want to say. And so that was one of my intentions for the book was that the ghostwriter would learn something from her clients of merit that would help her to have a better life and a more interesting life. And that would be passed on to the readers. And I think I've talked pretty candidly about this uh, in terms of like, what does it take to be a good ghostwriter? Because that's probably the second question I get is like, oh my gosh, how can you stand to do this? Like you don't get any credit and like 
they probably have big egos and they go out on Good Morning America and, you know, get all the glory. And um, I've been pretty candid about the fact that uh, my father is a recovering addict and probably a narcissist and that as the child of an addict and a narcissist, I learned certain coping mechanisms uh, and certain ways of interacting with other people and sort of intuiting their needs um, that have been incredibly helpful as a ghostwriter. And did I go into the industry knowing that? Of course not. And if I had not done it for as long, would that have come to me? I'm not sure, but it was really through writing the process of my memoir uh, which I did in 2015 and which got at a lot of those father-daughter issues. And at that point, I had already been ghostwriting for about seven years. So it was sort of all happening at once. And then fast forward to writing the book in like 2018, 2019, when I had even more ghostwriting under my belt. And I thought, yeah, you know, I, I do think that um, having some of those soft skills, some of those interpersonal skills are really as important, if not important, than my journalism background and my interview skills and some of the um, tools I have to actually write the book. You know, it is interesting. I started out in sports many years ago before I moved to politics. And, you know, I came to believe very quickly that the thing that makes uh, at that time, I was thinking just of athletes, but I've seen it also in politics and, and other things I've covered. I've covered a lot of different things over the years. Um, the thing that makes people at that level that are that are that have seriously risen that high in their world, the thing that makes them great is often the thing that is also a character flaw. Mm -hmm. It could be that ultra competitiveness or, you know, with athletes for sure, but also, God, God knows I see it in politics um, or just, you know, the 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 blinders of going after the thing they want without really you know having some of the skills you know the coping skills or the you know and i think sometimes that's what people maybe think you're seeing and i think it's all true but i didn't find that it made them um less human i think in a lot of ways it, it made them more human and so uh, I didn't have this question initially in my, in my queue here, but just hearing you talk and thinking about my own experiences back in those days, you know, what did, what did you learn? I mean, did you find that you, you learned something that surprised you uh, in doing this that you never thought you would, you would encounter, you know, I mean, was there, or, or has it been more just pretty much what you expected when you got into it? Um, I mean, I think I probably, well, let me back up a little. Because I had been doing music journalism and had, you know, spent time with quite a few famous musicians and rock stars and had been on tour buses and backstage, I had a certain comfort level with it. And so it wasn't like when I first started to work with celebrities, it was a completely new experience for me. And, you know, Mari talks about that in the book. It is sort of an art because when people are very famous, um, I think they get fatigued of always being the star, right? You know, me again, there's maybe sometimes it does flatter them. And it is, you know, especially if they've had some kind of difficult childhood that they're fighting their way out of or whatever, it is exciting for them to get acknowledged and get the attention. But after a certain point, they're, they are just normal people who are trying to go about their day, which is often a very busy day, a very demanding day. And they kind of need someone in the room with them, especially in their private spaces, who isn't just going to have their jaw on the floor about how amazing they are. And so I don't know that I was that surprised about like the nature of celebrity itself. I think I have been impressed with how much work it is to maintain um, success and how um, fickle the public can be. You know, also many people who write books are actually trying to mount a comeback because they did have a successful career in sport or on television and then through their own demons coming out or through a, a change in trends, you know, they've found themselves, you know, going from riches to rags and now they're trying to redeem themselves and earn some money. And um, it can be pretty brutal, but I've seen most of my clients really uh, act with a lot of grace and integrity um, and drive even, even when they've had reversals of fortune, or even when we're talking about stuff that's pretty painful in the book. That's great. Um, so your protagonist, Mari, uh, you know, 
she's hanging on by a thread in this story, <laughs> right? She, she's got family issues, of course. She's dealing with two incredibly difficult subjects. And I, I'm, I'm trying to make sure I don't give away too much here. But, uh, you know, she doesn't know from one moment to the next how this is all going to work out, right? That's a real challenge for her. It's all very stressful. Um, you know, I asked if you were ever surprised by anything. Um, I know you can't probably say a name. I wouldn't ask you to, but what was maybe the toughest assignment you ever had? Did you ever find yourself in a situation, uh, maybe not exactly like that one, but one that was as hard on you as that one, where you were just, I say, had the nails, <laughs> you know, hang in there, baby thing. You were just trying to make it to the end. Well, I mean, the, the, story or the the client uh, interview that sets up the book uh, is one that was based on my own experience. And so I can talk a little bit about that. Um, when I created the ca character of Mari, I knew that I wanted her to be a younger me. Um, again, I've written all those self-help books, so I'm just so evolved at this point. You know, I couldn't have a character who's just as evolved as I am. Um, no, I'm kidding. But she needed to really have a struggle. And so when I was... Um, working in 2011, I had done some ghostwriting. I'd had some success. Uh, I also had been ripped off by a client for quite a bit of money. Um, at least at that time, the way the contracts were written, they were between the client who's called the author and the ghostwriter who's called the writer. And uh, if the client failed to give the writer their final payment, there was nothing legally that the publisher could do. Um, and I would have had to go to the state where this person lived and sue them in small claims court to, to get the money back. And so I was really in dire straits financially and the publisher felt terrible about it. And so what they did was they gave me uh, access to a client um, who I got along with really well. Basically, they fast tracked me to get another assignment so that I could um, work my way out of this financial hole that I was in. And at the same time, I got put up for a book by them that was clearly going to be a bestseller. And I can't say who it was, but you can usually tell if someone has the right aspects in place for it to be a bestseller. Their name is well known enough. There's an aspect to the story that's surprising or mysterious or intriguing enough that people are going to want to buy the book. And um, I got sent to the polo lounge, uh, just like my character, Mari. I had this old beater Honda. I was too embarrassed to park it in the valet because I didn't want them to see how poor I was. I don't even know if I had the money for the valet. You know, I put on my like best clothes. I did pay to get my hair like done, you know, because I knew I was going to the polo lounge and it was fancy. Um, and I had to convince this very well-known celebrity over lunch that I had what it would take to write a bestseller for them, even though I had never written a bestseller. And it was a hard sell. Um, and so I thought, well, that that was good stakes. I remember living through them. It was scary. <laughs> I was so grateful to that person for taking a risk on me and hiring me. Um, and it seemed like a good opening for the book. Yeah, it really was. And it, does, it makes me think of something I've thought a long time, which is, you know, you will never in your life swim harder than when you're in the deep end. <laughs> you know? yeah. We've yeah. all found ourselves in the deep end at some point or another in our lives. Um, the thing, I mean, I love like listening to your podcast and hearing other writers experience, like we all have this passion to do it. Right. But um, there are times when you can't help but wonder, like, am I crazy? You know, why am I still fighting this fight. And I think it's a combination of passion for it, of stubbornness, of, you know, wanting to get back on top and prove that you could. Curiosity. I mean, I'm always like, I still have that journalist initiative. Like I'm always curious about the story. Um, so luckily all of those qualities saw me through that difficult time. Um, but what I will say in, in that real life scenario, uh, because there was another writer who had fallen through, which is quite common, we had six weeks to finish the book. And that included all the interviews. At that point, I was doing my own transcription because it was for, before the rise of like Rev.com and some of these transcription services that have become ubiquitous. And also some of the subject matter was very sensitive and the client was afraid there would be a leak. And so to you know give them peace of mind, I said, okay, well, I'm gonna transcribe it myself, which as you know, is insanely time consuming. And we got a two week extension but I did manage to write that whole book in eight weeks and it was a New York Times bestseller. And I don't know if I could physically do that again, um, but 
I'm so grateful I had the opportunity. I'm so grateful it all worked out. And it was a huge moment in my career. I mean, it did open the door for the opportunity to write other bestsellers, which is why Mari is fighting so hard for that in the book, because it, it does actually really matter in the publishing world. I, you know, I, that is all really just astonishing to me, you know, I mean, and, and, and to your point, yeah, I mean, I think stubbornness and all that is part of it, but I, I wonder too, like, like you noted, some of your clients are people who've, you know, been up here, they've been at or near the top. And then things have gone south and then, and they've come down many pegs. And I think you probably know far better than me, you know, once you've been up in this rarefied air, it's very hard to get back down here with us mere mortals. And I can only imagine that the motivations are very different. I mean, if you're up here on top, you may or may not have any interest in telling your story because why, right? But if you're down here and you want to get back there, I imagine that person's pretty motivated. I mean, have you found that to be the the experience? Oh, completely. And it can also cause them to be very emotional. And, you know, that's part of the other aspect of the book that I tried to get at. And it's really not me being Pollyanna-ish or just making nice because I want to keep working in the industry. Like I have a tremendous amount of sympathy for someone who is, say, in that hypothetical situation we're talking about. And, and they've got so much at stake, financial, but also psychological, emotional, um, sometimes they don't behave that well. I mean, sometimes they can be incredibly pro and they're like, let's get this done. Let's hit the deadlines. This is so important for me. Sometimes they're, because they're terrified, they miss meetings or they miss deadlines. And I think that can be an aspect of human nature, right? You can see someone kind of dropping the ball when they really can't. And so part of my job as the ghostwriter is to get the book done, to hit the deadlines, but also to support them emotionally, to talk about that. You know, you can't let someone blow off meetings without commenting on it, but to sort of try to get at what is happening underneath that, you know, and to not just be uh, locked in a battle of wills, but to to look at sort of the subtle uh, emotional aspect that's happening. And and when you ask me like what has surprised me, I think out of everything, the, the aspect of it that surprised me the most came up in my writing of how to, um, of, what's it called? How to be a ghost of the last days of the Midnight Ramblers. Uh, there's this prologue that is called How to Be a Ghost. And it was one of the last things that I wrote. And Mari is setting up the book and talking about why people would possibly do this very difficult job. And she says that um, partly they do it for love, that they love their clients. And I realized that that was true, that I had actually cared very deeply about all of my clients, maybe in different ways and to different degrees, but something really intimate had happened in the process of working with them. And it often was because of something you like you've described, you know, where the stakes were high for them. And um, it was a lot of responsibility and also an act of, of trust for them to hand me their story at this moment in their lives. And we became, you know, very intimate in the process of working on it together. And so it's, it's an incredibly fascinating job. You know, I've asked other writers who are exclusively fiction authors as uh, something along these lines before, but uh, and I didn't have this again in my queue of stuff, but this is often how it goes. Um, I, I I often will ask writers, especially when they write really you know noir, you know hardcore stuff, what role empathy plays in their writing. Uh, you know when you're trying to develop characters, and to me that was one thing that was so clear throughout this book. You had a have a very deep empathy for these characters, and and obviously the people they are you know, somewhat loosely based on, um, but, but, you know, but tell me a little bit about that. Tell me, I guess how, I mean, you've described it as such great t detail, but do you think of it that way as, you know, needing to have empathy as a, as a real tool for doing the best job you can do in the situation? Oh, absolutely. Because partly it's just so you can have a working relationship with this person that will function, but also I think it's difficult to conceptualize the idea that you are actually writing as them. You are not reporting on them. You are not doing a magazine profile of them. You are inhabiting them and their story and their voice. And yes, you spend a tremendous amount of time with them. You get access. Often they do some writing, even if it's like text memos or emails so that you're getting some nuances of, of how they write and how they think. But just imagine how that is different from reporting. And and I have really cared about people I've 
reported on as well. You know, I mean, I do think there can be something intimate about covering someone, especially if you're on a beat like politics or music and you see someone throughout their career and the ups and the downs. I mean, you can come to care about them a lot, but it's it's just a whole nother thing to step into their experience. And um, many of my clients have been men. Many of my clients have been African-American uh, many of my clients have been from different cultures, different religious backgrounds, um, pretty much any type of um, qualifier we put on a person when we're describing them, uh, whether you think that's significant to who they are as a person or not. It just is part of the package, right, of how we tell their story. Um, I've worked with all different types of people. And again, it's just an incredible level of trust for them to give me. And so I try to be so empathetic for starters. I mean, that's, it's, it's almost even more than that. I think that's why I use the word love. And it's, it's sort of a weird ephemeral thing to talk about. It does sound a little, like I said, Pollyanna-ish or, you know, it's not, of course I have boundaries and structure and I'm a professional. And I, I also interact with the editors, which is like a very, like, what are the deadlines? What is, when are we going to copy edit? Like I have those conversations as well, but something about working with the client is, um, so, uh, intimate. And it's interesting that you brought up noir because one of my favorite tropes of noir is the poor, like, hero, anti-hero, detective. I feel like I would see it in, like, the Ross McDonald books where, like, he is getting battered and he keeps doing the right thing. He keeps doing the right thing, but he's getting, like, punched. He's getting shot. You know, he's just, like, living on whiskey and coffee. And he's, like, hasn't had a shave in days. And, you know, like, his shirt's ripped. And he's just, like, going and going. And he'll still, like, rescue the kitten from the tree or, like, drive the extra distance to, like, go rescue the person. And so I really thought of Mari like one of those characters because there is a toll, right? Like, and and yeah. you can't do it forever. But when you're solving the case or in her case, you're hitting the deadline and there is also a mystery she's solving as well, you really go that extra distance, right? And so in her case, she's at a fancy hotel in Vegas for much of it. So it's not quite the stakes, but she is, you know, she's starting to fall apart a little bit. She's, she's sleep deprived. You know, there's a lot of alcohol. There's a lot of coffee. She drinks Earl Grey tea, like by the gallon. Um, and I wanted to give that, that feeling. So I hope that that came across a little bit, whether you consciously or subconsciously picked up on it. Oh, absolutely. I, I, I mean, that was part of the enjoyment of the story, not, not only learning what happens with, you know, the ultimately whether these books are going to happen or she solves the the mystery of, of Maul's death or, uh, you know, anything else. It was like, is she going to make it to the end, man? And, you know, that, that, I mean, fabulous job there. Uh, that was definitely something as a reader I, that kept me kind of glued to the page. Um, and, I, and I will just tell you quickly, because I find it very funny. Um, my editor, Zach Wagman, who's amazing, uh, he's at Flatiron now, but he had been at Echo and has worked with like Ivy Pachoda and Steph Cha and some just really wonderful thriller writers, um, Alex Segura. Um, he was like, Sarah, she drinks way too much tea. And I was like, you know what, Zach, I drink even more tea than that. He's like, I'm sure you do. But like, she cannot drink tea in every scene. It just becomes exhausting. And I was like, well, okay. Good note. Good note. <laughs> well, I will tell you that another uh, writer that's been on this on this podcast, um, debut author, a great book. Um, there was one scene he wrote. I'm, I won't detail it. I'll just say it's some bathroom humor. And it's one of the few times in my life I have laughed. And until I, my wife was looking at me like, "What is <laughs> wrong with you?" Because you know, we're in bed at night. And I just I couldn't even tell her I was laughing so hard. It went on for like twenty minutes. And so later on, you know, when I had him on the show, I said, dude, that was that was the funniest thing I have read in forever. And he said, oh, I'm glad you thought so, because my editor was telling me, you realize you have a bathroom scene in almost every chapter, right? It's a little <laughs> much. And I, but it, so I had to fight to keep that one. And I said, well, thank God you did, because it was funny. I don't normally find that stuff funny, but that was so funny. I Seriously, man, I, I, I sell out. I, literally, my wife was like, you... Boy, you are such a child sometimes. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're not wrong. Um, well, I guess they, when they say you have to earn it on the page, right? So in yeah. that case, you did for whatever reason. And and hopefully when Mari drank her tea, it was earned. You felt like Absolutely. That was the moment she needed a cup of tea. <laughs> well, I, I want to go back to this book because, again, yeah. I love this book so much. And I, and, and particularly, I want to ask about the, the Stones connection and particularly Anka and Dante, a.k.a. You know, Anita 
Halliburton and Keith Richards. I know it goes, you know, based on loose lips. Um, but those two characters, Anka and Dante, they, they come off so much more sympathetically than any of the others, um, which from my perspective as a longtime Stones observer really seems to mirror the reality of the world quite well, um, particularly for Keith, not so much for Anita because she faded out of the spotlight a lot more than Keith ever would or could, but he's become like everybody's you know, favorite ex-junkie uncle, right? I mean, everybody references him about how old he is or whatever the case may be. And it's just really interesting to me that that his arc as a person. So tell me a little bit more about how you developed this story and those characters, especially with this incredibly, these two incredibly iconic real life people looming over your shoulder. Mm -hmm. That had to have, I mean, you had to have felt a lot of pressure, even knowing these are fictional people, that there were going to be people like me going, uh-huh, right. uh-huh. Well, it's true. And because I am a rock obsessive myself and have written about music, have lots of friends in the industry, I wanted to get it right. I really care about this world. And it is sort of my love letter to a world that I don't live in as much as I used to in my 20s. And so... Um, it mattered to me. And hopefully that's partly if it is successful, why? Right. Because I put so much love into it. Um, I think in terms of the Anka character, I did start with Anita Pallenberg um, with how she's described in Keith's book. Also, there's a wonderful um, biography called She's a Rainbow that's, that came up after she passed away. Um, Keith also had, we'll see if you know this because you're such an obsessive. Keith also had a girlfriend in the 70s named Ushi Obermeyer. Uh, who's a real woman who you can tell the the German uh, influence on Anka's story. There's a wonderful biopic. I believe it's called Eight Miles High. It is. Uh, yeah, which is so <laughs> fabulous. And she's like almost more fascinating than all of the Rumbling Stones combined. I mean, her real life seems just beyond. And then, of course, Marion Faithful, who in real life dated Mick Jagger, but she has an incredible memoir called Faithful, which I feel like is some of the best writing about the Stones. And she just has these little moments of insight about Keith and about Mick. And maybe it's because she's been in recovery for so long, so she doesn't have an ego. She seems to come at it with this real humility. But I felt like, gosh, I, I think out of everyone, Marion Faithful might have some of what to me seem like the truest insights about these incredibly powerful, famous guys. And so I thought, well, is that true? Could someone who was intimate with with a big star know more about them than anyone else by just sort of observing from the shadows? So I took that as some license to create a character that was a little bit com combining all of those. And then I've talked about this a little bit in interviews um, you know, what I've been promoting the book, it wasn't until I had completely finished writing it that I realized that in some ways Anka was also based on me because when I was in my 20s, I had a, had affairs with several men in bands. And although they were not nearly as famous as the Rolling Stones, when I wrote my memoir, I went to them and said, you know, I've included you in my memoir. And most of them asked to have their names changed. And I thought that was very painful for me at the time. And then I realized, uh, as I was writing Anka, well, and like I said, it wasn't even until I had completely finished, I had done copy edits. The book was almost done that I thought, oh my gosh, I think I'm kind of Anka. And I had written her with so much more dignity. Um, there's certain things that she chooses not to tell. Um, I don't think that's a spoiler. You know, she's really careful about her power and her insider status and, and not just as um, a way to hold on to that power, but thinking like who gets to tell the story is really important and what they tell is really important. And so I, I loved the choices that Anka made. And I think she makes them out of love and out of um, dignity. And when I went back and thought about some of the men I had written about in my memoir, I realized that um, two of them were in pretty active addiction at the time we were involved. And that although I knew them, how well did I really know them? And was it my place to be the definitive expert on their story. And so as I've gotten older, I have way more grace and humility um, about what I feel like I'm able to tell. And I'm at peace with that memoir. I did the best I could. I also wrote it out of love, but I do think I love. I really enjoyed the opportunity to write Anka and to kind of go back and revisit some of those topics in a fictional way with more maturity, with more perspective. And then in terms of the character of Dante, who is loosely based on Keith Richards, um, I knew quite a bit about 
sort of the tropes of Keith, but um, I really wanted him to be his own person. And I think what surprised me the most about his character, and I don't know if this is true of Keith Richards or not, it's definitely true of Dante, is that he loves his children. Like he can go anywhere, do anything. He has access to everything. And the only person he picks up his phone for is his kids. And when I realized that Dante was just this incredible dad, that sort of unlocked him as a character for me. And I think all of us as writers, like those are the moments we love the most, right? Because they sort of surprise us. And once we get that down, then we're like, oh, I know this person. And for me, one of the most satisfying emotional moments in the book comes later on. And it's it's a moment uh, that could only have happened because Dante does have that that sort of paternal aspect to him. Yeah, absolutely. I'm pretty sure I know the exact moment you're talking about too. And you know, it's interesting. We we were talking before uh, a few weeks ago before we got to this point where about the uh, new Anita Pallenberg uh, documentary that's out of which is on Amazon Prime. If anyone wants to see it, that's uh, highly recommended. Um, and I want to ask about Anita, something about Anita here in just a second. But the thing that got that caught my attention was uh, the reference to Keith not really being a good dad when the kids were young. Marlon and I, I don't remember his daughter's name now. And then they lost their one son uh, to, to SIDS, uh, sudden infant death syndrome. Um, but it certainly seems that the part where his public persona, his image has evolved into something much more positive comes about the time when he got straight and then became a much better father. And I just think that's something we can all relate to. Mm-hmm. You know, my, my, my daughter's 30, well, will be 38 years old here uh, in December. And, and, you know, she just got married this last weekend. And, you know, it, it really made me think that, you know, it doesn't matter. They're always your, she's always my little girl, always will be to, to my dying breath. Right. And I think when you see that, when at least when a guy sees that in another guy, it's re- regardless of whatever else has gone on, I just think there's something there where we we can forgive a lot of stuff. And I don't know if it's the same for women. I know, but when I see men being good with their children, because, you know, we often aren't, um, you know, I, I, I give them a lot of leeway. So I, 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 I don't know if you caught that in the documentary or not, but that was definitely something that caught me when he talked about not being a, a good father when he was younger. I haven't had a chance to watch the documentary yet. You you know, you were the person who recommended it to me and it's high on my to watch list. Um, I'm excited. I, I feel a special love for Anita. I think she was, from what I understand, a complicated person and also quite a bad drug addict. And I mean, that's, it's sort of difficult, I think, to have your personality uh, and integrity and, and all of these things, um, you know, questioned when when you were actively addicted for so much of the public story. And of course it, it is much harder on women. I think when there has been addiction in the home and, you know, I, I think I, I'm sure she also got sober and had a chance to be a better mom. And I understand like at the end of her life, she was like riding her bike around London and gardening and like a, a pretty doting grandmother. And, you know, so I think she probably had her own redemptive arc. It just hasn't been quite as famous as Keith's, but yeah, I agree. I think there's just something so human about seeing someone care about the important stuff in life, family, um, you know, and also some of what Dante does is, is just, he like reaches a hand out to someone in need in this really beautiful way. And mm-hmm. I think our assumption or our stereotype of a rock star would be that they wouldn't think to do that or they wouldn't care or they wouldn't even notice that that person was in need. And I wanted to write Dante as a person who would. And I, you know, again, I don't know Keith, but he does seem like a pretty remarkable person and a pretty thoughtful person. Um, so, I mean, hopefully there is some overlap between the character and and the real guy. Sure. Um, we talked a lot about Anita, but I did want to um, maybe have you address this just a little bit more, which is, you know, she was portrayed a lot, referred to a lot. And, and I've heard this even fairly recently, uh, seen her referred to as a groupie, which I think is really unfair in, in a myriad of ways. She was not a groupie. Any more than Marianne Faithful was a groupie. I mean, I think that's that because that, even that term has such a 
negative connotation to it. Um, you know, but I think it probably keeps in in light with the longstanding misogyny of the music business, especially at that time where women were so disregarded and seen as such less than compared to their male counterparts. Um, so we've talked a lot about how you saw her, but was it conscious thing? Was it a conscious thing for you to try to show her in a different light and to really show her as a as a more evolved person, warts and all? Oh yeah, absolutely. And that was sort of the one of the major satisfactions of the book was the idea of giving the spotlight and the microphone and 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 the story to someone who would have just been in the shadows. I mean, not that Anita was exactly in the shadows, but she she never had the the full spotlight or uh, you know, money or um, protection that Keith had. And I do think that is one of the saddest aspects of the real story for me, both for Anita and Marianne, is that they both had severe drug addictions and they just didn't get the support. Um, you know, they both lived pretty desperate lives for a while because of that addiction. And of course, no one would let Keith do that because he was so valuable to the band and so valuable to the whole like label and 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 everything. So even though he was also struggling a lot, you know, there was so much protection around him to keep him safe and keep him functioning at at least the most basic level so he could keep making albums and keep touring. And so I do think there it, it's a more vulnerable place for women unless you are the artist like maybe Stevie Nicks you know has been rumored or been quite public to have had some serious addict addiction issues and because she also was in the band you know everyone was also keeping her on track so it, part of it is just the financial realities of the business it is artistic but it also is a huge business um but yeah i i i wanted to give them um dignity i wanted to give them a story. I, I was curious about them. I was like, what What was it like to be there backstage? And I also think having spent so much time in the music industry, and I think um, Cameron Crowe gets at this really well, uh, not just in Almost Famous, but he also did a wonderful show called Roadies. I don't know if you saw that, but it was only one season. And it's really about the roadies. And and you do know that when you spend time around bands, like it is a whole ecosystem. And it's very lonely on the road. It's incredibly boring. It's very stressful. There are often a lot of substances. And so I do think the people who are in that inner circle, even the women who literally would be described as groupie, like the dictionary definition of a groupie, are important to that ecosystem and kind of help to keep the band functioning. And so, you know, you can think about that what you will. And I, I do love the the affection that Cameron Crowe, I think, brings to those characters, which is sort of a tangent. That's not quite what we're talking about right now. But I also was thinking about that, right? Those characters that he wrote, because I think he he drew that from his own experience as well. And there are only some people who would want to run away with the rock and roll circus. There are only some people who could do it. Um, I did it for a little while and and it was fun and exciting and I learned a lot and um, it definitely helped to make me the artist that I am. Um, but it it's a weird place out there. You know, it's it's not always as glamorous as we might think. And so I wanted to try to get at a lot of that in the pages of this book and in the character of Anka. Well, you definitely did, and it's true. I mean, the 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 sword definitely has a double edge to it. There's no question about it. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about him, but so the character most obviously associated with Mick Jagger in this book, Jack, um, he doesn't really play a major role in the book. Um, I mean, a significant role, but but certainly he's not one of the you know the the the, the main main characters. But, but an important character. But it made me think, too, um, he, as Mick Jagger often does, really comes across as um, somewhat craven. And, and uh, I'm not sure if calculating is the right word, but that's the word that came to my head. And that uh, maybe a little of the way uh, Paul McCartney's critics have always have him, that he's so business oriented that every everything is looking toward that keeping the machine going and how do we how do we monetize that and and all of those things and so I'm just uh, I, I, you know curious there um, did you ever have maybe in earlier drafts or anything where this the character of Jack maybe played a bigger role was that something that was always meant where he would have uh, a lesser role so you could focus on 
Anka and Dante. I mean, how did how did that evolution happen for you, if there was an evolution? Yeah, there definitely was an evolution, and it's a good question because I mean that is a huge uh, factor. Is that a band itself is an ecosystem, right? And and certainly Keith and Mick or John and Paul, like we have these famous duos within the bands. We have these famous quartets or quintets, you know, and and sort of the way that they get along is as much a part of the legend sometimes as the music itself. And I think as I was writing, I didn't initially think, well, he's going to be a big part or not. But what I realized as I started to write the character of Jack was that either to have both Jack slash Mick and Dante slash uh, Keith as real three-dimensional characters in the book, I was either going to have to make them more closely based on the real people, right? Because for them to both be in scene together, it, or or it would pull too far away from, like there sort of was this tension. And so, yeah, Jack is a little bit more of the stereotype. You know, I had a little bit more fun with it. There's a scene between him and Mari that's pretty playful, um, and and is sort of based on more of the like lazy stereotypes or or stories about Mick Jagger. Um, I don't know him personally. You know, I do hear that he's quite a hard worker and takes very good care of himself at this point, and uh, you know, probably is quite a successful businessman. Um, and so I just realized that I was either going to get into one of those sort of um, like, you know, there's these popular novels which I enjoy quite a bit, where it's like the actual wife of Ernest Hemingway narrating the book, or it's, you know, it's, it's trying to imagine the fictionalized internal world of a real person. Uh, and I just, that wasn't the book I wanted to write. So I felt like I had to keep, as I was writing, I realized I had to keep Jack kind of to a minimum and, um, it was going to just allow me to kind of walk this line. I was trying to walk of what was based on reality and what was fictionalized. Yeah. You know, I saw Mick, well, I've seen Mick interviewed a lot, but I saw uh, an interview he did with Dick Cavett back in, must have been right around 1970, because he was still pretty young, youngish. And, um, you know, Dick Cavett was as good an interviewer yeah. as anybody who had come along up to that time. And it's fascinating. If you ever find this on YouTube, seeing how easily and completely Mick controlled that interview. Anything he did not want to address, he slept off to, well, we're getting ready to go on stage. I can't talk about that. And then he talked for another 10 minutes. But then something else would be, um, yeah, I can't talk about that. We're getting ready to go on stage. And Dick Havill would ask him, you know, why don't you want to talk about it? But, uh, yeah, we're getting ready for the show. Okay. And then he'd ask him five more questions. And so it it was a masterful bit. I mean, as having been, you know, in the Dick Cavett role on that a few times where someone is just not answering, but they've got all the power there because, you know, you're a nobody, they're a somebody, and you you need their information, and they just won't give it up. You yeah. know, and they have it. And watching him do it, and I, I think he would, I, I don't know where he was born, he looked like he was probably in his late 20s. To have that level of confidence and skill was pretty pretty incredible to watch. Even in hindsight, go, he's good. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that you get at something which is interesting because it's, it's one of my favorite aspects of the book to talk about. And we haven't really touched on it yet, which is it, it was as much as I love the Rolling Stones, it was I felt a little bit risky to choose them as the model. They're quite old at this point. Right. They're um, they have become a little bit of a joke that they're still touring. I mean, I, I hear that they I haven't seen them recently. I hear that they're still playing at an incredible level of like athleticism and and passion and talent. Um, but I I really wanted to choose a band and choose members of that band, characters within that world, who I thought of as true bohemians, as true originators, as true artists, because I wanted to get at something about what it means to have an original life. And I really think when I read about the Rolling Stones going to Morocco or like, you know, Keith and Anita and uh, Marianne and Mick going to South America to look for UFOs on LSD, like the things they were spending their money and their time and their passion on at that moment in cultural history 
was different. It was fresh. And I do think it has completely influenced how we think about being an artist, certainly being a rock star. Or, you know, if you did have all the money in the world and could do anything, what would you do? What would you care about? And so I wanted to purposely write characters who could teach Mari something about living a good life. And I didn't want it just to be about being an artist. I think that's important. Certainly, uh, Dante is a very talented artist. And in some ways, Anka is an artist too, like an artist of her life, you know. Um, but I, I wanted it to to have some resonance. And um, so I was very conscious in how I wrote those characters and uh, put them sort of towards the end of their career and lives so that they could reflect back on it maybe in a more thoughtful way than someone else would have. You know, the last, I guess, well, no, I actually have two more serious questions, but, but th th this is one of them. I was going to ask it earlier, but um, it actually maybe fits better here, which is, you know, we've t all this talk about the stones and, and all this cultural history and the, 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 the magnitude of the stones and, and then the fictional story that you, that you have so masterfully done incorporating so much of their mythology into this fictional way. Did you ever feel any sense of pressure that, you know, there were going to be people like me who, you know, are, like I say, kind of stones obsessives. We're going to be reading this and maybe judging it a little differently than if it was just a fictional story that was not connected in any way to these icons of not just music, but of an entire half century plus of, of global culture. I mean, that seems like a pretty pretty hefty uh, thing to take on. And uh, granted, you had all this experience working in the world and the, and the rock world before this, but did you feel pressure that, you know, there are going to be Stones people who are going to rip me a new one over this because of whatever, right? Did you feel any of that? I mean, I did, especially because I do care about it so much. Like I am the person who would want to get it right. And not just from a gear perspective, which I did work on and all of those little details, but also from like a spirit perspective, right? Did I catch the spirit? Did I, did I get at something of the spirit of the band and their music and what makes them so special? And I will say when I was going out for blurbs, which as all writers know is an incredibly fraught part of the process um, because you feel like you've got your hat in your hand, you're asking for favors, which is uncomfortable. Um, I was talking to some friends who work in the record industry and we were thinking about, you know, who did we know, who could we get access to, who would be meaningful. And one of the people who blurbed it is uh, a musician named John Doe. And of course he is in the punk world more than the classic rock world, but he is also an icon. He is also a master of what he has done. I mean, X to me is one of the best punk bands, also one of the best bands writing music about Los Angeles, about California. I mean, they're, so when he read it and gave me a positive blurb and loved it, I felt such a sense of relief that someone who has also sort of given his life to rock and roll could could feel that there was something authentic in it, you know, was was so meaningful to me. Um, and then I will say that's just the kind of challenge that that excites me as an artist. And I did feel, I think, and I it's interesting you asked this, and I've obviously been promoting the book since February. So I've had a lot of conversations about it, but no one has asked me quite this. And I'm kind of surprised by my answer, which is that I think I wanted to see if I could pull it off. I think I knew it was going to be a challenge. And I do think I spent enough time in this world and also with celebrities as a ghostwriter that I felt like there was something I understood about their nature that I could get at. And I felt it was more important than just knowing what type of guitar they played and what type of amp they played it through or, you know, which tour they were on when this certain thing happened. You know, it was it's really about, again, the spirit of of being an iconoclast, of being an original. What does that feel like? And I feel like I've been close to it enough times and it is very exciting. I mean, there's a reason we put these people up on pedestal pedestals. You know, they can be very charismatic, very original, very funny, very clever. Um, and so when people say they enjoy spending time with Dante, to me, that is like the highest compliment because it, it is, uh, the culmination of everything I was trying to do in the book. Well, yeah. And again, you did it really well. Um, 
Two things I will say, I love Dave Alvin. He's one of my very favorites in the world, but uh, John Doe's singing on, uh, I think it was at the US Festival on 4th of July is my favorite. He, he that, that was just great. He His voice was so much better and deeper and more resonant than Dave Alvin's, even though I love Dave Alvin, I would, I would go anywhere to see him. Uh, and then, you know, just thinking about, um, you know, that as you noted, this time you've spent here in this world, in this in the world of music, what's next for you? Is this something that you would, you know, are there other stories maybe from your time uh, covering all these very, uh, very famous people in this very insulated world in some way that's out there for all of us? Um, you know, are, are, do you see yourself doing more work in this or are you working on something else completely different? I mean, what's next for Sarah Tomlinson? Well, um, I have always had such passion for music and the music world. So it would not surprise me if I returned to it at some point. But I also feel like in many ways between my memoir, which does get at my experience of being a young music journalist in um, pretty extreme detail, and then this, which is my fictionalized dream version of it, I feel like I've covered a lot of what I had to say. And I always will go over this with my clients, you know, even if they've um, been on some of the most iconic movie or television sets in history, or they've, you know, been in a famous band or something, you, it's really not every story can have the gravitas to teach the reader something. It can start to feel very anecdotal, even if the people are famous, even if the settings are exceptional, right? I, I call it like shaking your pockets out. It can start to feel a little redundant. And then you're like, well, how can this be redundant? Like these are some great stars and great icons. And so I think in some ways I've talked a lot about the emotional truth of the music world for me. And so I don't know that it would behoove me to go back and, and tell more stories of it unless I really found like an emotional through line that was fresh for me. Um, but I was lucky enough to, to sell a second book as well um, to Flatiron and to my editor, Zach Wagman. And so I've been working on that and it's called Occupancy and it's also a mystery and it's set in the Airbnb world. Um, I actually do own an Airbnb and I know they're incredibly um, contentious and controversial, especially here in California, where real estate and is such a, a huge issue. Um, I wrote actually an op-ed for the LA Times uh, when Ramblers was coming out about the fact that in part, I bought my property in Joshua Tree because I could not afford a property in Los Angeles um, as a single woman. And to me, Airbnb has been this sort of democratizing factor. It has allowed a lot of people to become homeowners and to maintain their homes uh, who maybe could not have uh, before it. But I also completely understand the other side of the argument that it's it's taking affordable housing out of the marketplace. But because of that, I think it's an incredible setting for a mystery um, because when spooky things start happening, you know, you're like, is it something spooky that's happening in the house? Is it something political that's happening in the community that's targeted at me? Um, so that's been a completely different world, but something that's a lot of fun and hopefully very um, juicy to write about. Well, I look forward to that. I, I really do. That sounds fascinating. I've covered the Airbnb issue as a reporter. Uh, you know, I'm originally from South Lake Tahoe. If you know anything about South Lake Tahoe, you know yeah. that is a huge, huge yeah. fight going on there now. Yes. It never end. So, yeah, that's fascinating. I, that's great. It sounds unique, too. You're not going to probably hear too many people writing about that issue. So, Well, and you'll laugh. Uh, I'll, I'll stay this here among friends. Um, and you can bring it up to me when I'm out uh, talking about occupancy in 2026. But um, I, my home is in Joshua Tree, which is probably almost as contentious as Lake Tahoe in terms of what has been happening out there. And so I was a chicken and did not set it in Joshua Tree because <laughs> I just felt like it was too complicated. And also it's difficult. I mean, I, I think this would be, again, we could start the whole podcast again and get into a topic like this, but there is writing what you know, and there is sometimes being too close to an issue and having too much skin in the game. And so I set mine up in the Pacific Northwest where they're having much less, um, uh, it's it's just much less tense. And so there are, all of the same factors are at play, of course, but it allows me to, to, um, to hopefully just really examine it from a lot of different perspectives, but but it's not quite so fraught. Right. 
Well, I look forward to that. I wish you all the success in the world. We have come to where, uh, how I like to always end the show, something fun. I, and honest to God, we could talk about this all day. I mean, we could. <laughs> you could talk about rock music and mysteries and writing and uh, all day long. But uh, for both of our sanity and for all of you folks who are out there right. kindly listening, we're going to wrap this up now. But as you know, I always have a, a closing question where I, I, I get to play the omnipotent being who can put you together with one of three people. Uh, who would you choose and why? And the, the irony, as soon as you 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 mentioned this person earlier, and I said, I swear to God, I don't make these up on the fly. I had these all chosen a long time ago. So uh, the options that I'm going to give you are the great German it girl, Uschi Obermeier, who clearly you know something about, uh, Priscilla Presley, or Mark Bolin of T-Rex. Oh my gosh, Mark Bolin. A, because I'm in love with him. And... I feel like because he passed away so young, yeah. uh, I believe he was only 30 or 31 when he was killed in a tragic car accident. His wife, his poor wife was driving at the time. I can't even imagine how heartbreaking that was for her. There's just not that much known about him. He had right. sort of a brief career. And I will admit, um, I was with a client uh, who is in the rock world. And, you know, you're not you do become friends with people, but you also want to be so respectful of their time, right? Because they are very important and busy and you have a whole book to write. But I did say, um, I just have to ask, um, you know, you, you met Mark Boland. Can you, can you please just tell me a little bit about what he was like? And they're like, oh, I was on the top of the pops or I was managing an artist who was on the top of the pops the day he was on there. And I, and it was just so lovely. Like he is that one person who gets me excited. So um, I, it would definitely be Mark Bolin. I kind of had a feeling. <laughs> <laughs> I do my research. I knew I knew your favorite band, but yeah, but yeah. you know I'm a huge T Rex fan too. I love I love and, and for my money, Mark Bolin might be the most underrated rock star of his generation. But partly because, but it's weird, you know. Jim Jim Morrison dies at 27. You know, Brian Jones dies at 27. Jimi Hendrix dies at 27. Janice. Um, um, uh, Kurt Cobain. Um, oh God, what's up? Sorry, the British woman. Her name just went out of my head. Oh, Amy Winehouse. Yeah. Now then they die young and they, and they become, you know, these legendary icons. And we seem to have almost forgotten about Mark Bullen and Mark Bullen might have it's been so the purest rock star I've ever seen. I mean, if you ever looked at a guy and said, that's a rock star, you could, you could have been in Walmart and you'd go, that's a rock star, right? Yeah, Absolutely. completely. It's guitar sound, his guitar um, styling, I mean, the way he held his guitar, I mean, it's known that David Bowie did borrow some stuff from him. And so uh, obviously D David Bowie did an entire thing. I won't go into another hour on the differences between Mark Bolin and David Bowie. But um, I do think there's something so strange about Mark. Like he's a genius and yet it's a little, he was a little bit out there. And I think people don't quite know what to do with him in terms of, is he a sex symbol? Is he a mystic? Is he just a rock and roll guitar player? And so I do feel like he's kind of fallen between the cracks, but people have- like Sid Barrett in my mind. He's oh a little God. bit like Sid Barrett. Where... Sid Barrett is a genius. And the Pink Floyd albums with him on it, I mean, like the best. And if, even if you listen to some of his solo work before he basically stopped recording, it's so different than Pink Floyd, but it's it is fabulous stuff. It really is. He just another guy who maybe a little on the spectrum, I think. Um, but you know, at a time when that no one was making much of an effort to understand people like that, and uh, you know, who were nerd up divergent in some way, and um, just you know. Yeah, I don't know enough about Sid Barrett and Mark Bull in, in, in total to say how much they were alike, but the the story and the, and their early demises and all those things, to me, are very resonant with each other. And uh, just two deeply unappreciated uh, major, major stars. So, yeah, but sometime we'll have a whole conversation about that. Yeah, well, maybe then, in the then last... You run at each other at a conference again, I, I see a few cocktails and lots of conversation about, about rock stars. That's what I was going to say. Are you going... I'm sorry to interrupt, Rich. Are you going to BoucherCon? I will not be a BoucherCon this year. August is a huge um, work month uh, around here, around the capital for a variety of different things. And uh, but I, so I'll probably have to alternate back and forth. So I, I will definitely be there next year. Uh, I'll see you. I look forward to seeing you in the future. I'm going to hold up the book one more time. The Last Days of the Midnight Ramblers by Sarah Tomlinson. Sarah, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. It was great meeting you. And it was great having you come on the show and talk more about the book. I love the book. 
I cannot recommend it highly enough. You do not have to be a Stones obsessive. Uh, <laughs> it might help if you knew a little something about it, but even if you don't, uh, you know, I think people will absolutely enjoy the book. You've, you've really crafted a, a wonderful story without, I mean, yeah, I guess somebody died, but, and maybe there was a murder, but it was a long time ago. There's no blood <laughs> and guts in this. So, you know, don't let, don't let any of that dissuade you. Anyway, check it out. Hold up one more time for the people on YouTube. Check it out. It's also a great cover. Yeah. Well, Thanks, Rich. It was so great talking to you. I really appreciate you being such a careful reader and 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 just it takes so much time to prepare for these shows, I know. And so it, it's really incredibly gratifying to come on and have such a deep conversation about why we do this and what we're trying to do. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Well, well thank you. I really appreciate it. Well, I will tell everybody, if you haven't hit subscribe, please do so. Um, leave me a nice review that does help other people find the show. Uh, maybe even better than that, yeah, if you enjoyed the show uh, and you think someone else you know might enjoy it, please tell them about it. Uh, ask them to, to check it out because if they're interested in writing, in this case, if they're interested in music, uh, publishing, whatever, this is a great way to hear a lot of really good insights from people who are elbow deep into the, into the world. And, um, you know, you might learn a lot. I know I do every single episode. It's the reason I do it. I don't make a penny doing this. You'll notice there has not been an ad. You'll never hear an ad. Um, the people who love me sometimes tell me I ought to be monetizing this. I tell them this is the only thing I get to do in my life that I don't have to worry about making money. So no, this is the time when I just get to talk to smart, intelligent, creative people and uh, and hopefully share their insights with you. So um, yeah, tell somebody else about it. That'd be fabulous. Uh, the last thing I'll leave you with is the same thing I always leave you with. I mean it every time. Tomorrow's not promised to any of us. So please, whatever you do, uh, make today count. For my guest, Sarah Tomlinson, more time, the last days of the Midnight Ramblers, myself, Rich Eisen, uh, my two crazy English setters who are around here somewhere, Stella and Pippa. Um, this has been the Open Mic. We will see you next time. <laughs>